Hi, this is Phil Cashin. Uh, this is the Winter Circle, episode 19 of season one of the 2023 PRS season. Today, we're going to be talking with Rusty Almer. Uh, Rusty, this past weekend, won the Blue Mountain Revival uh, two-day national PRS match. And uh, so we're going to talk to him a little bit about the match and, you know, some things that Rusty does to kind of help him do as well. Rusty is a very, uh, very top level shooter uh, and the PRS has been doing this for quite a number of years. And uh, we're going to see if we can get some data out of him to kind of help the rest of us catch up to him. So maybe he'll, maybe he'll cooperate today. How about that, Russell? Will you help? Will you help us out a little bit? I'll do what I can do. Okay. All right. Well, hey, congratulations on the victory. That was uh, that was impressive to say the least, man. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, you, was... you. Rusty, by the way, is a um, is a is a senior shooter, so he's he, he's killing it this year in the senior class. I, I I thought I might have a chance to maybe catch him, but after this past weekend, I'm not sure if that's going to be possible. But uh, but he's 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 a uh, uh, been a staple in the long range shooting community for many years. Uh, just a great guy, very well respected in the shooting community. Um, you live in Arizona, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so <clears throat> why don't you tell us a little, a little bit about yourself, and you know, just a little bit on your bio and kind of how you got into shooting long range. Well, okay. My name is Rusty Olmer. I uh, I live up in the mountains in kind of northeastern Arizona, um, a little town of about three thousand. And uh, so we got a lot of National Forest Service around us. So I've kind of made a range out here that uh, that we shoot off of. Um, but uh, how I got into long range shooting. Um, well, first of all, I have a wife and six kids. Um, young, I have two kids still at home. Um, the youngest is nine. My oldest is 32. So I have them <laughs> strung out quite a ways. Um, and we all live in Arizona, but uh, I guess when I when I was in high, I grew up with a BB gun in my hands, you know, terrorizing the local birds in the community, and, <laughs> and uh, so I was always shooting. And then uh, when I was in high school, I moved to Washington State, and uh, when I was a senior, and uh, one of my first classes, uh, my you know first day, we were going around telling telling everybody who we are, what we like to do. And I said something about hunting and my teacher said, Oh, are you on the, on the rifle team? And I said, the what? And I said, Oh yeah, we have a rifle team in the school. I'm like, you are kidding me. So anyway, I, I joined the rifle team and, and proceeded to win state. It was a, it was a small bore, you know, positional prone sitting, kneeling, standing. And uh, so anyway, shot a little bit in college after that. And uh, after co in college, just kind of got more into archery, did some archery competitions after college, and then just mostly bow hunted for the next 30 years or so. So did a lot of that. Um, and then I retired and needed something to do. So <laughs> I, uh, I, a buddy of mine, Nils Foley, started talking about this PRS stuff. And so I was all, always interested in, in shooting and shooting long range sounded like fun. So we got into that and that's kind of how I, how I got started. So that was, that was in, I think I shot my first local match with the Milkoviches in, I think February of 2016, something like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I went down there and, and uh, shot a local match with a left-handed gun. I'm right-handed. Um, and uh, you know, I remember I remember very well shooting the first PRS barricade. I go up there and, you know, when you're the way I learned to shoot positional, when you shoot kneeling, you put your, your left knee up and that's not the way to do it. She, Regina goes over there and shows me how to do it. Put your other knee up. And anyway, so I, uh, I knew nothing about it. I had a lot to learn, but uh, that's how I got started. Oh, so you, so when you went from Arizona up to Washington state and you, you went up there as a senior and you got on the rifle team and did you say you won the state championship that year? Yeah, I won state in, uh, I won state in sitting, kneeling, offhand, and the, the uh, conglomerate, the total, whatever they called that, um, couldn't win prone. There's this girl at this other school that always beat me. And uh, when I got into college, 
I uh, was having trouble seeing, so I, I went and got my eyes checked, and they were really bad. Man, when I got glasses, I'm like, no wonder I could never be prone. I mean, I was always getting like 98s and 99s prone. She was always getting 100s. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> anyway, wow. and since then, I've gotten had some surgery on my eyes, so they're a little better. I don't need to wear glasses anymore. That's, I mean, so your first year shooting in high school, you joined the rifle team and you went to state championship and you know, three of the four shooting disciplines. That's pretty, that's pretty strong. Well, like I said, I had shot all my life and shooting was just kind of pretty much automatic. So. Wow. Well, you have a knack for it. That is for sure. Um, okay. So the match this past weekend, the Blue Mountain Revival, who, uh, who, this was in uh, Vernal, Utah. Who was the match director? Eric Anderson. Eric Anderson, okay. Anderson, he uh, he put it on. It was his first national two-day PRS match. Um, I think he did a regional finale or some regional series match there before. Um, but in February, he put on a NRL Hunter match. And I went up there and shot that in two feet of snow. Um, it was pretty tough conditions. Um, there was no wind, but just the, the snow, it was, I mean, my sky pod froze. I couldn't, I couldn't close. I couldn't move it at all. It, it froze up. Um, that's how cold it was in the morning. And then, uh, you know, after the first, about the two stages, it, uh, it warmed up enough that I could move it around, but, uh, it was kind of awkward shooting in that kind of cold weather. But it was, I don't it was, think I've ever heard somebody's bipod freezing up. That, that's I know. it was man. I, I I hadn't either, and so I you know you shoot in some of these bad conditions and you learn how to shoot in some of these bad conditions. But until you do it, you just don't know. You know. Well, so next time you're gonna you're gonna dip your bipod in like antifreeze before you go out. Exactly. That's what people said that they need to do up there. I've never shot in that, so I didn't know. But now I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> Well, I would assume that the uh, being in uh, at the end of July, I would imagine the temperature was a little a little more favorable for for snow, getting some range. Snow was all gone. Yeah, yeah good. Um, it got like ninety five, ninety eight degrees. I think it was it was toasty. You didn't need a sweater. Um, the wind wasn't too bad. I don't think it ever got over twelve, um, but it was it was just switchy and miragey, and it was. It wasn't real tough conditions, but it was, it was tricky conditions. Well, you, um, so you shot a 192 out of how, what was the potential number of points at the match? 198. So you dropped six shots on two days. Right. Wow. Uh, that's, that's pretty outstanding. Uh, you know, <clears throat> so what, I mean, that's the hit percent. The win. The hit percentage for the winner was. I don't know the calculation on the top of my head. Probably ninety six percent, ninety seven percent, somewhere in that range. Right at ninety seven. Yeah, ninety seven percent. You know, occasionally we have these matches uh, where the hit percentage is really high, and you know they. Um, I know, like the first match of the year, I think Austin Bushman. I think he cleaned the Leupold match out there in Texas. I was there. I watched him. I was in the squad uh, right in front of him. I watched his last stage when he cleaned it. And that was a tough stage. I thought there's no way that he's going to stay clean in this bus. So he's shooting on the bus and I just shot it and it just tore me up. And uh, so it was impressive to watch. Oh, so you shot in front of him on that stage? Yeah. Well, we, I was in the squad in front of him. Oh, the so squad in front of him. Okay. All right. Watch him shoot it thinking, because I knew he was clean. And uh, that man, and I just shot the bus. I'm like, that is just tough conditions. Cause you're in the bus. You can't feel what the wind's doing. And it was up and down and it was strong. And you just, the target was way out there and hard to see. I'm like, there is no way he's going to clean this. And he did. I was very impressed. He's a heck of a shooter. He, oh yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's one of the best in the sport right now. Uh, you know, it's interesting on those matches. Uh it, I won't, I won't name a name, but I talked to a shooter who was at, well, actually both of the matches and, you know, they, they, they lament on the fact that when they fall behind on a match where the hit percentage is so high, it doesn't really give them a chance to catch up. Um, and my, you know, and my, my response back to them is, well, did the best shooter that weekend win the match? <laughs> and, and of, of course, in both cases, yes, you, you won this match this past weekend. I mean, 
it's like, you know, like a PGA tour event, you know, if the, if the winner shoots 30 under and the guy that's in second place, shoots 28 under, well, I mean, the best golfer that weekend won the match. And, you know, so the, you know, we see, we see all kinds of different hit percentages that it takes to win matches, you know, from the, you know, the mid years, mid, you know, from a hundred down, you know, from a hundred percent down to, you know, probably in the high seventies, I think we've had some that have been that low, but um, those matches right there where you, you just can't make any mistakes and that, you know, for a two day national match where you're pulling the trigger 190, uh, 98 times to only miss six shots, uh, is just amazing. I mean, like, how did you, okay. And like, so you're, I'm look, I'm going to look at your previous five performances, right? So you won this match, you finished in 10th at the Hornady PRC match, 11th at in the best in Texas, uh, eighth at the Ruger match and 13th at the uh, box Canyon match. Right. So, I mean, you've had some really good finishes this year. I mean, you've had the one in 13th and the rest have been in top tens and then you win this match. So how, you know, did you do any, did you, what was different about this match that allowed you to shoot so wonderfully and come away with a victory? Well, I've been, I've been trying to, I'm not very good at seeing hits on target. And I've really been trying to work on that. In fact, I, I started, I live about two and a half hours from the nearest serious PRS shooter. So I'm, I'm practicing alone most of the time. Um, and so I don't have anybody to stand behind me and, and, you know, bounce things off of and say, Hey, I think I hit on the right side. And they say, no, you hit on the left side. And, and I've, I've just always had a difficult time with that. So I started videoing myself through a 60 power spotting scope video, the target, and then I will call out loud. Okay. I think that was on the right side and then I'll shoot again. And I think that was center. I think that was left. And uh, when I started doing that, I was wrong most of the time. And uh, I, I used the JC steel uh, hook hangers. And so you know, what I realized, and I had, I had talked to Morgan about this before and he'd say, you know, you're, you're not seeing the first, you're not seeing the first rock. You're seeing the second rock. You know, it immediately, when you hit it on the right side, it immediately goes right real hard, but it does it so fast that by the time your eye catches it, it's coming back and it's rocking left. And that's what you're seeing. And I wasn't, my brain wasn't capturing that. And so anyway, I had to kind of reset, do a, a reset on my brain and, and finally was able to start reading the plate. And uh, anyway, so my main, my main thing I was trying to do in this match was look at every, every hit and see exactly where you're hitting on the plate and try to make those minute corrections. And so this match, you know, a lot of times you're, you're shooting 90 seconds. It's really fast and I can go fast. Man, I, I make the mistake of seeing that I hit the plate, but not really paying attention. Okay. That was on, where was that? Make a, make a small correction on the next one. I just hit the plate and I'll go to the next one. Or if I miss off target, I'll see where that was and, and make a correction from there. But uh, this one, we had two minutes and it, we just had plenty of time. And so I wasn't, I didn't feel rushed at all. I, I could stay in the, in the scope and try to figure out, you know, I think I hit about, you know, midway from middle to right edge. So I'd make a correction. And I think that helped me more than anything. Okay. So when you, and that's a great idea, by the way, I mean, putting, you know, put in a high magnet. So you, you, you had a, a camera set up on your spotting scope and you would pick a target and basically just run stage and shoot at that one target and then call out, uh, you had a microphone probably tied into the camera and you would call out what you think the target did. Yeah. I just had my phone on, uh, attached to my spotting scope. Same thing I use when I'm hunting for videoing animals. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it's, you know, the target is this big in the, <laughs> on the phone and, uh, you can see right where you hit with that it's just so much easier than you can through the scope. And so just been working on that a lot. And I think that helped a lot. Okay. So you, so obviously you went back and, and you reviewed the video, right? So you shoot a stage or several stages or whatever your training session was, and you would go back and you would review the video and see that your percentages of calling accurately accurately were off. You know, they, they weren't a hundred percent, right? So they were almost a hundred percent wrong. Whenever I hit in the middle, I could call it, but when I would hit on the, on, on an edge, almost a hundred percent, I would call it wrong. 
And so I'm like, okay, something's, something's going on here. And I really slowed everything down and was able to realize why I was calling on the wrong side. Finally, what Morgan told me was sinking in and, and uh, I was able to, to reset. I'm still working on that. I'm, I'm certainly not, haven't perfected that yet, but that's, that's what I've been working on. Well, okay. So if you're, you know, like if you're in a match, right. And, and your percentages of seeing what's going on downrange accurately were off. Right. So let's say you hit on the left side of a target. You think you hit on the right because of the way that it swung. Well, then obviously you would, you would make a correction, you know, to go to the opposite side. And typically that would equate to a higher miss percentage. Right. I mean, like that would cause you to miss a lot of shots. Exactly. And that, that negative, <laughs> I, I, I stopped doing it just because it didn't work for me. And so that's why I kind of got in the habit of just watching long enough to see that I hit the plate and then moving to the next target. And so it was a, it was a difficult reset, you know, it's old dog, new trick thing. Um, and so I'm, uh, you know, I'm still working on it, but that's, yeah. So, that's, so, that's, pri that's so prior that. to this, so like if, if you're shooting a stage in a match, and you would hit the target, and basically, if you're going to have a follow-up shot, or you're going to move to the next position, provided that the you know the line angle of where the target is from where you're shooting, you're pretty much going to hold that same wind. Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes if I saw trace and I saw it going to the right side of the target and I hit right, you know, I could tell. And sometimes, depending on the strap system, you know, if it was a like I say, those are the hardest ones to read. If they're a double strap or a single strap or chains, or there, those are a lot easier to read. And I didn't have a problem with those. Um, but as far as seeing the the rock of the target and also seeing the the spall off the target, those are the things that I've been trying to trying to work on. Um, but so yeah, I a lot of times I could see and I would make corrections. But if I wasn't positive, if I wasn't positive about it, then I wouldn't try to correct. I just didn't trust myself because. Anytime I wasn't positive and I tried to correct, it was wrong. And I almost thought, well, if I just do it opposite, then, you know, opposite of what I think, <laughs> then that's the way to go. And I'm like, that's just not a, that's not a good positive mindset. <laughs> no, no, it's hard to shoot, hard to shoot opposite of what you think. That's for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so you, but again, I mean, this is a, I mean, this is a, this is fascinating by the way. Uh, when you were going through this training and then you go to this match, and you had a longer part, part time. So you had two minutes rather than a minute and a half. Uh, and did you just kind of like, was your main focus going up to a stage after you kind of got any idea about what, you know, how you're going to run it, what your anticipated, you know, what starting wind call is going to be to really just kind of slow everything down and really focus on, uh, you know, keeping the rifle steady and paying a real close attention to what the target's doing. I mean, is that kind of how you're able to kind of turn it around? Yeah, you know, I've, I've been shooting long enough and I'm fast enough that I didn't have to slow everything down. I was still moving fast, getting on target fast, but that extra second of watching that plate after you hit it and trying to figure out where did I hit? I mean, I think a lot of those stages, most of them wouldn't have been hard to shoot in 90 seconds. Um, I think a lot of guys would have had difficulty, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly fast. We use tripod rear support a lot just because we had time. Yeah. Um, and I just, uh, yeah. So I didn't slow everything down. I just slowed that part down. I, I just didn't feel rushed. I knew I had enough time. And I, I did that on all but one target. And it was, uh, it was the long, we had to shoot the long range stage, second to last stage of the first day. And it was down in the bottom of the Valley and the mirage was horrible. And I'm going up to that. I'd only dropped four point no three points up to that point and uh going up to that stage thinking man this could be a train wreck because the what we had to do was shoot a i think it was like 875 950 and a thousand three targets spread out along the mountain quite a pan and we had to shoot one shot from one shot at each target from three different spools and these spools were huge and they were really wobbly and so um Anyway, I go up there and I hit the first target and I could not tell where I hit it. Um, hit second target, couldn't tell. Hit third target, couldn't tell. And I go over to the next wobbly prop and you know it's, it's taken me some time. I mean, two minutes sounds like forever to do that stage, but these props were so wobbly, I was trying to get the wobble out of them. Wasn't able to do it. I mean, I had four tenths of horizontal wobble and uh, 
went to the next prop and hit all the targets. And then um, I've got an audible timer and it said 30 seconds. I'm like, man, I'm taking too long on this thing. I need to, I need to step it up a little bit. And the first shot off the third prop, I had been hitting everything. I said, well, I don't have time to, to watch this thing. I'm just going to shoot and I'm going to, or maybe I had 20 seconds. I didn't have a whole lot of time and uh, I didn't watch. And I'm, I move over to the next target and I'm waiting for them to say impact and they never said impact. And I'm like, oh crap, I don't know which side I missed off of. So I guessed and uh, I guessed wrong. So I, that, that, that one thing cost me an extra point. Um, was able to you know see where I missed on the second one and correct it for the last shot and hit. But um, so two of my shots were two of my misses were right there. But uh, yeah, so I was able to do that. I felt like I did that very good on I think all of the other shots. Man, <clears throat> that's got to be. I mean, how how gratifying that must be after you know recognizing that you've had a, a technical challenge you know your ability to kind of see what's going on with reactive targets i mean we have a lot of targets we shoot in the sport or center hung you know the j hook type targets yeah. and and you're right i mean like especially if you hit on the edge i mean it's that thing rocks back and forth very quickly and but being able to recognize that that was you know one of your weaknesses and practicing and then having it all kind of come together and winning a match man i bet that ride home was was had a big smile on your face didn't you yeah, that was that was rewarding. It was, you know, you you go to a match and and the guys I ride with, one of the I always ask them a question, what are you what are you trying to work on on this match? You know, everybody's trying to work on something all the time because none of us are perfect, right? We all we've all got stuff we want to work on. And so we each talk about what we're trying to work on and and uh that was the one thing that that I said I'm trying to work on. I want to I want to take the time to look at each plate and see which way it rocks, try to make a correction. And yeah, it, it really paid off on, on a lot of those stages. I was, I was able to do it. So yeah, it felt wow. good. That's, that's pretty awesome. Thanks. Well, so uh, you were on after the, uh, after the Saturday portion of the match, I think Nick Godarzi was ahead of you by a shot or two. No, Nick was behind me one shot. Um, I had dropped five shots and he had dropped six. Um, and so he was one behind me and the next, the next person, um, was four points behind me, I think. And, uh, and then it dropped down from there. But, uh, so having Nick Adarzi one point behind you, you know, you can't make a mistake, right? I mean, Nick doesn't miss. He's, he's an awesome shooter. And, uh, so going into day two, I'm thinking, I got to do this clean. I just got to do it clean. And, uh. I went through eight stages clean. And then on the ninth stage, it was a 180 degree pan. We had five targets. First one started way over on the right. You shoot twice at it, shoot twice at the next one, twice at the next one, twice at the next one, twice at the last one. And uh, the wind had been coming from the south, but then it would switch and come from the southeast. I mean, like a 45 degree switch. Wow. and it would go up and down from almost nothing to about nine miles an hour. And so it's like, depending on which angle and what velocity, when you've got a 180 degree pan, I'm walking up to this stage thinking this could be a train wreck. It really could. I really need to make this work. And uh, anyway, I hadn't talked to Nick all day. He was in, they were in the squad right behind us. And so I'd seen him, but you know, Nick's not the most talkative guy out there. And, and I'm usually not real talkative. I'm pretty much in my head the whole time trying to focus. So we hadn't, we hadn't spoken at all. Anyway, um, I go up there and I, I dropped the first shot on the fourth target, put it right off the edge of a 750 yard diamond and uh, was able to see it and correct it. And and uh, just dropped that one point. And when I was walking off stage, having my gun and my brass and my bags, and I'm walking by, and Nick is already there because they've already shot their stage, and he's watching me. And I look at him. I'm like, Nick, did I give you the opening you needed? Because he had he had won the tiebreaker. I knew that I had to beat him. I couldn't just tie him. He beat me by three seconds on the Paris the skill stage and uh he said dude i just gave you the opening you the cushion you needed um he dropped two on a on a uh, kyl a couple stages back he said i couldn't hit that little target anyway so i knew i had a little bit of a cushion still 
And uh, anyway, then went on to the, the next stage, the very last stage, 12 round stage. We had a, uh, and we had a plate rack just about straight south and a plate rack just about straight west. And you had, uh, it was a two, a two plate rack on each one. It was a big target, little target and big target, little target. And you had to go off of an H brace over here, shoot, and you weren't allowed to use tripod rear support. You had to shoot big, small, move over here, shoot big, small, and just keep moving back and forth. So 12 shots. And uh, the wind with the way it was changing, I'm like, man, this could also be a train wreck. Anyway, that I was able to able to clean that. And again, just watching the, the movement on the plate and it really paid off because the wind switched a couple of times while I was shooting that stage, picked up, slowed down. And when it picks up one direction, you know, and you're shooting 90 degrees to it, and then you're shooting right behind, you know, it's at six o'clock. There was a lot going on at that on that stage, but uh, it worked out okay. So I knew I had it at that point. You cleaned it. Yeah. And Nick ended up dropping a couple of points on the, the 180 degree stage that that was his last stage. So uh was able to pick up a, a few more points on him. And you dropped, so you dropped one day on uh, one shot on Sunday. Yeah. One shot on Sunday. Man, that is just how outstanding is that, man? That's just fantastic. <laughs> it felt good. It really did. Yeah, I bet it did. Now, okay, so on on that on the stage, that last stage you were talking about, uh, where you had the big small target and and you know varying different uh, angles of, of of shooting there, and the wind was obviously a concern. You know, you feared a train wreck might be coming, and it and it didn't obviously. So, like when you're on a stage like that, like how and you and you're have this additional concern about potentially changing winds and target direction, which can be very difficult to manage. Um, how do you go about approaching a stage like that? Like, and then also while you're shooting the stage, what are you looking for to kind of give you the understanding about, you know, what, okay, the wind may have changed or what are you seeing? Like how, what's your approach and how do you do it? Well, I, I usually don't write down a whole lot of wind columns. I mean, I had on the stage before the 180 degree stage, I had four wind columns written down and looking at my card it was so confusing <laughs> just like okay it depends on what direction and the velocity of the wind and anyway it, it it worked out okay but i usually i'll usually write down a wind column and uh i usually don't ever look at it i mean i i kind of memorize it beforehand but i i, I never look at my dope card um i, I shouldn't say never probably once <laughs> once a match like i looked at it there I, in fact i looked at it for the one target that I missed, I'm like, okay, this should be about a 0.6. And <laughs> it was a 0.3. Um, anyway, but on that stage, on the, the last stage that I was talking about, um, I knew that the wind most of the time was coming from the south. And so it would be, well, and the, and the target was over here. So I started with a 0.4, but when, uh, when it would change, it would come from over here. And so it just, you know, there's just a lot of mental math going on. And it's, I've always been good at mental math. Um, but so you get to shoot the, the big target over here first. And I happened to hit right in the middle. So I went to the small target, happened to hit right in the middle. Um, and I was using 0.4. And I knew that with the direction of the wind, it was going to be at, that it was going at that time. If I was using 0.4 on that, I was probably going to need about 0.4 three on this other one. So I used 0.3 and it seemed to hit right in the middle, use 0.3. Um, and then the next time through it, uh, the wind, I could see the mirage. I was just watching mirage to see if I needed to change. Wind picked up, I could see that the mirage picked up. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna use a 0.5. So I use 0.5, hit in the middle, use 0.5, hit in the middle. And I'm thinking, okay, 0.4 over here. So I used 0.4 on the big plate and rocked it left. So I'm like, okay, that's too much wind. So I cut it down to 0.3 again on the little plate, hit it in the middle and just went through like that. But like I say, it's just paying attention to the mirage. Um, there's no real foliage there. It's, it's uh, you know, it's just a desert country with, with scrub brush. And so not, not a whole lot of foliage to look at. So it's pretty much just the mirage is all you have to, to work with there. So is that like when you're, um... 
when you're when you're getting out on the rifle, getting ready to take your first shot, are you are you do you kind of have in your mind what you think the first wind hold should be, or are you kind of going to react to what you're seeing with the mirage and how it's how it's moving? It it depends on the match and the the situation, but when the wind is real switchy like that, I totally depend on what I see through the scope with Mirage. I mean, I'll have an idea. Yeah. I was a second shooter on that stage. And so I, uh, the shooter that shot before me, actually, I was worried that I was going to have to time out because it was 12 rounds and a lot of movement, different targets, different directions. I was thinking I was going to time out, but the shooter that shot in front of me, um, he's from Arizona. I've shot with him a lot and he got through it and I'm usually a little faster than he is. So I figured I could get through it. And so I was able to take my time and and uh and look at each shot but uh i i always look for mirage before each shot unless it's two shots at one target real fast and i see that i i see that i hit in the middle then i'm just going to take another shot real quick but uh before when, when i get on a new target i'm always looking at mirage first before i pull the trigger before i decide what my wind hold is going to be see if it's changed and that's you know you're looking at mirage the entire time the whole squad is shooting and I'll ask a lot of guys. I've heard some of the guys on your podcast say, yeah, you know, like Francis, he was saying he doesn't like to listen to other people's wins. And I do, but it's not because I'm going to use the same wind hold that they're using. It's, I want to know when that of course depends on the shooter. If it's a, if it's a good shooter that you can kind of depend on their wind um, I'll listen to their wind hold and I watched them shoot and I saw where they hit on the plate and I want to, I can see what that mirage looks like. So, okay. He needed a 0.3. He thought he needed 0.5 because he kept hitting on the right edge of the target, but he needed 0.3 to hit the middle. And that's what the mirage looked like. So when I get on the scope, if I get down there and it looks like the same mirage, I'm going to use a 0.3 or a 0.5 if he needed 0.5. But uh, yeah, I'll ask a lot of people what, what their wind was, but it's not because I'm going to use that. It's because I watched the mirage and I saw where they hit and I'll extrapolate from that what i need to use in that kind of mirage movement wow yeah i'll tell you that's you know it's um it's interesting how uh you know you have i mean i've inter interviewed a lot of match winners this year uh and they there's 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 not some consistency in how they interact with other shooters you know during the shooting of a stage you know like francis kind of you know puts his earbuds on and listening to music and to, to zone people out. Right. And, you know, I, you know, I've shot with Morgan a number of times and, you know, like shooting with you and, you know, we, we communicate with, Hey, what'd you start with and what'd you end with and what have you. And of course, you know, there's always a variance that you've got to kind of take into account, but, um, but it's inter kind of interesting how, you know, I mean, some people want feedback and, and they have a way of filtering that data, you know, based on the shooter and maybe what you've seen in them, and what their wind calls and hits have been in previous stages and what yours have been, you know, if they're, if they're half mil and you're maybe three cents or whatever, uh, based on maybe their zero or their bullet or whatever. But, um, yeah, that's kind of interesting how it's not, it's not all the same. And there, there, there's so many ways to skin a cat to win a match in this sport. And, the, and, uh, you know, there's some, obviously some common features, but there are certainly some pretty dramatic differences in how people do it. Um, yeah. And so you know, what I found interesting, you, you know, you said a couple of times uh, you approached the stage and you, you, you use the term, oh, my gosh, it could be a train wreck. Um, you know, there are probably some competitive mental coaches out there that may not recommend that. <laughs> I, I guarantee you there are. And I don't I don't play that mental game. Um, I don't berate myself. Um, but I also don't fool myself. I'm a realist. You know, if, if, uh, if something's going to be difficult, I want to accept that it's going to be difficult. And, you know, we've all had train wrecks. And if anyone's been shooting in this sport very long, you've had a train wreck. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, and so when you're going up to a stage, you don't want to have a train wreck. And so one of the things in my mind is, okay, what's the safest way to shoot this? All right. What's the way to clean it? But also what's the safest way you know yeah we all want to clean every stage but you know you shoot enough matches and like anyone who shot any of paul dowling's matches i mean you're not gonna you're not gonna not time out everybody's gonna time out 
he makes them so difficult that, I mean, I love his matches. They're awesome. Um, but you have to have it in your mind that I'm not going to clean this. I think I have time to get 10 good shots on this. And so this is how I'm going to do it. And he does that intentionally because he wants to, to test that, you know, and a lot of people get up there and try to get all 12 shots off and, and it's a train wreck. So one of the things that I try to avoid are train wrecks. <laughs> so like, so when you approach a stage like that, that you, that you foresee as being pretty difficult, I mean, does that kind of, uh kick you into a method of maybe a little bit deeper planning like i really need to kind of think this one through a little bit more just to kind of get my game plan together it's just not a troop line with targets from 500 to 1000 100 yards apart with two shots at each target in the same wind call you just lay down there and read the wind but i mean you're i mean do you feel as though like when you see that potentially challenging stage that it really kind of kicks in a higher level of focus and preparation for the stage Right. And, and, uh, and like I say, I, I have it in my head. I put it in my head that don't worry about the clock. You're not going to finish this stage. That's okay. You know, this is a, a 12 round stage, but shoot it like it's a nine round stage. You have to, I know how long it takes me to go shoot a particular, you know, a particular stage. And if I know that it's going to be too long, then I don't, I don't want to go up there and try to get all the shots off. And it's, you know, I listened to you talk to Nick and uh, he says, I got one speed and my body does that speed. And if it's, you know, if I time out, I time out. And uh, I, I don't, I won't say I go that far. I, I can speed up and I can slow down, but uh, I know my limitations and, and if, if they're tiny targets and I know that I, I'm probably not going to get them all done and hit them all, then I'd rather get nine hits than you know, six hits and six misses. Yeah. Well, good deal. Well, that was a, that was an outstanding performance now. So, uh, so like leading up to the match, uh, when you're, you know, a day or two or three away from leaving, you know, you kind of go through your pre-match routine. Do you do anything like specifically with verifying data, confirming your, your accuracy, uh, I mean, are you, are you, or is there kind of a, a routine that you go through prior to a match that you think helps you out? Well, I mean, yeah, as far as confirming data, like I said, I, I built my own range out here. It's 15 minutes from my house and I've got, I don't know, 25, 30 targets out there up on from uh, that I can shoot from up on top of a hill and it's about 108, 170 degree spread. Um, and I've got some that are set up you know, right above my zero board. I've got one at 250, 400, 500, 750, 900, 1,000, and 1150. So it's it's awesome for confirming data. And I do that all the time. I probably do that too much, but I don't ever want my data to be off. I want to know that my elevation is good. Um, and so I, I do that a lot. Um, I go up there and practice, probably not as often as I should, but I've been practicing more lately um, just because I've been trying to work on that one thing that I told you about, about seeing, seeing the impacts on the target. Wow. Well, it worked out this worked out well this weekend. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So let's, let's see here on two, on two day national matches. It looks like your first one was back in, uh, in April of 2016, the battle of breakneck. And that was a memorable match. <laughs> Worst weather I've ever shot in. Yeah, there wasn't a very high round count in that match. It doesn't appear so. <laughs> but what happened was they canceled the second day. I mean, okay. <laughs> I shot one day and we had 35 mile an hour winds, snow, sleet, hail, rain. It was It was horrible weather. I learned a lot about what not to do in <laughs> in bad bad weather conditions like that um learned a heck of a lot i uh i think i got 100th position out of like 180 shooters something like that yeah 100 so it was it was humiliating but uh but i learned a lot i learned a ton on that first match so it was good well so you you won uh you won two national matches so this is your second victory of you know of quite a few top fives and top tens um I noticed on 
And it's kind of funny. We talked, yeah, I talked, we talked to them about this with Francis last night for regional matches. You shot 23 of them on the Paris website. You've won 16, which is 70%. And you finished in 100% of them in the top five. Every, every one day regional match you have shot, you finished in the top five and you've only not won six, uh, seven of them. That. So it, I think you and Francis are pretty close there for the you know, the best shooter in the history of the PRS in the regional series. <laughs> but that's that's amazing. I mean, sixteen out of twenty three regional matches. That's uh, that's that's pretty special. Well, you know, it 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 costs a lot of money to to talk to these guys that are really good around here and pay them to not show up to some of these matches so you can win. You know. Yeah. Hey, well, that well, whatever you're doing, man, it's working. <laughs> Now, you also uh, you also shoot in the NRL. Uh, you've done quite well. Uh, let's see. So last year, it looks like in the uh, in the Grand Slam Championship, you finished in second in the factory division. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. And uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, this year, it, like you're tied for the lead. There's a bunch bunch of 100s in um, in both factory and in open light division. So you, you, yeah. So I, you know, I, I commented before we got started that how awesome the backdrop is there behind you. Uh, that is quite a, um, you're, you're showing off a little bit back there. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it. Well, I would do it too if I had that on the wall. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, that, that looks like a, a many years of, of hunting. So, how can you, uh, what has helped, which has helped more hunting has helped PRS shooting and NRL hunting or vice versa? Like, what do you think is, has, has like, what is shooting in these PRS and NRL matches? Like, what has it done for your hunting and vice versa? Well, not, they really don't correlate because most of these are killed with bow. I, I bow hunted pretty much. Oh, okay. So, I mean, a lot of these coos whitetails that you see behind me there, those are killed. Some of those are killed with a rifle, um, but you can't see the rest of it. But uh, <laughs> over the room. I'll just give you a little tour. Oh, my goodness gracious. Wow. Anyway, most of that's done bow hunting. And so that really doesn't have anything to do with with the PRS. I mean, yeah, I do like two rifles and once in a while I'll, I'll hunt coos deer with a bow but that's or with a rifle but that's about it okay so completely unrelated pretty much yeah yeah I mean, well I so have shot coos deer at a little you know you shoot a coos deer at, at 600 yards and and uh, it's nothing now you know when, <laughs> yeah. I, when i was a kid when i was i remember i killed my first one of my first deer when i was 12 years old and that was back when we didn't have range finders you know it's a 308 lever action and uh, did have a scope on it and uh, have no idea how far it was across that canyon, but I held about a foot over its back and pulled the trigger and <laughs> killed it. <laughs> wow. But, yeah, that's how we used to have to do it back in the day. Back in the day. That's right. We've come a long way since then, haven't we? Now we know exactly where to hold on, you know, 350 is nothing. Well, so in the NRL, uh, in the factory and on the light division, you're shooting a completely different setup. I mean, it's much lighter. Uh, you know, your 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 management of, of recoil and and really being able to see what's going on downrange is uh, is significantly different. I mean, right? I mean, do you do you kind of see pretty healthy differences between like the NRL hunter series and what we do in the PRS? Absolutely. I mean, the the skills that you learn in the PRS are really really helpful. I mean, you can't excel in the NRL hunter without those skills that you learn in the PRS, but there's a lot of other skills that, that you have to use in the NRL hunter that you, that you didn't use in, in the PRS. Um, you know, you have to, you have to locate the target and, and then range it and then figure out how to shoot it from wherever they're letting you shoot it from. But uh, yeah, you're using a 12 pound rifle. If you're open light 16, if you're open heavy, um, you know, and those, you can't use a six millimeter. I think you can use a six millimeter in factory. If you use factory ammo, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but uh, pretty much you're using a, a 25 or a six five. Um, and yeah, it's a lot more, it's a lot more recoil. 
with a lighter gun. And so, yeah, you're having to, you're having to tame that recoil and you can definitely tell a difference when you're shooting, when you're used to shooting a 23 pound dasher, you know, it could have a 12 pound six, five. That's a significant difference. So you really have to pay attention to that to be able to see where you're, where you're hitting or where you're missing. Wow. Well, that's, that's, so, I mean, like in those NRL matches, uh, you know, you'd kind of mentioned some of the challenges you have with kind of spotting, uh, what direction the target is moving when you hit it, you know, I would imagine with the heavier bullet and more recoil and a lighter rifle that really challenged that, that skill set. It really, it really does. So you have to make sure you get a really solid position and, and, uh, you know, your, your MPA has got to be, got to be really good. And it's hard because you're not on a prop. You're a lot of times you're on some weird rock or, you know, they get you in some pretty weird positions, but, uh, so, you know, one of the big challenges is finding the targets and you have four minutes to find them all and figure out how to shoot them all. But, uh, so that, you know, having hunted a lot, that definitely helps that sport, you know, two, two really, two really, there's a lot of differences between the, the PRS style shooting and NRL hunter for sure. Wow. Well, you, you do well, in ver you do very well on both of them. So that, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, Okay, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your equipment. Um, what in the in the PRS match? This one that you won this past weekend. What kind of soccer chassis are you running? MPA. And which model? Right on that match, I ran the um, the uh, BA comp. BA one comp. Of my, one of my BA comps. Okay. I've been running the 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 uh, Matrix Pro. A lot of that, but this weekend I I didn't do that. I uh, I ran the comp. Well, sometimes sometimes the old familiar is, is a good way good way to go, right? You know, I kind of go back and forth on those. I mean, the the four ends. You know, you and I have had these conversations, but uh, some guys really like the narrower front end. Some guys really like the the wider four end, and I really like both of them. And I've tried to figure out which one I like <laughs> best, and. Uh, I, I decided I wanted to kind of do a hybrid. So I put the, uh, I put the rails just part way back. So half of my bag has a rail on it and half of it doesn't. And it seems to, it seems to be a good hybrid. So I don't know. I, I, it worked out well. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, uh, and, and what kind of mount or rings are you, uh, are you running on, on the rifle? Hawkins two piece, uh, heavy tactical. Okay. Excellent. And, uh, what action? It's an impact impact 737 and uh who is the barrel maker and who is doing your chambering work proof um proof barrels and eric anderson or eric anderson eric anderson was the match director eric goss of axis works he's down here in in uh, the phoenix area in tempe he's been doing my chambering since pretty much since i started this stuff i got you okay and are you um are you running a barrel tuner i do not okay and what kind of muzzle brake? Um, I am actually I'm using your brand new muzzle brake. You uh, the DN five you just came out with. I had not you sent me that. I think it was one of the original ones because it wasn't even finished. You <laughs> sent it to me, and uh, I got to admit I really like. I've, I've been using the Axis Works enabler brake, and and I uh, was very happy with it. And a few days before, actually, I was going to shoot suppressed on this match. Um, I use a KGM suppressor and I was all set up, had my dope all figured out. And, uh, I'm like, you know what? I, I need to, I need to try this break. Phil says it's awesome. Holy cow. That thing keeps the muzzle down better than anything I've ever used. And so I'm like, okay, let's unscrew that suppressor, put this brake on. So I shot your brake. It was awesome. I think that helped me see a lot better on target where I was, uh, where I was hitting. So kudos to you. That was, that was good good call well that's well that's part of the that's i mean that's that's the whole design intent of the break so they give the shooter the ability to see more downrange so and I, uh, I, i'm glad that worked out well for you excellent and you're sending me a titanium version for the hunter series we've got the hunter championship in a few weeks and i'm stoked to try that on my hunter gun to see how well that does because that's where it's really hard to stay on target and see where you're hitting so can't wait to get that yeah i can't wait to hear the feedback um uh, and and what kind of uh, what kind of bipod or bipods do you use in these matches in the PRS matches? Skypods. Skypod. Yeah. 
I usually take a single pull and a double pull. Um, I'll use a triple pull in the Hunter series, but uh, this stuff, single pull and double pull. Yeah. Uh, and are do you, as far as your data uh, during the stage, do you have an armband or do you have like a data card on your rifle or do you have an electronic or how are you keeping track of your data? I put a data card on my, just a manual written data card on the side of my gun. Okay. And you're running a six dasher, is that correct? 105 hybrids. And I slowed them down to, I think that's another thing that's helping me see better. Um, slowed them down to, these were going just over 2,800. And I'm used to shooting just over 2,900. So like Francis said, that it's, it's, a, it's a slight difference in time, but you add everything else together with the the diminished recoil, the faster that that recoil is getting done faster, all of it put together, it really helps you. Yeah, it, it's amazing the difference in 100 feet per second and your reaction time to be able to to kind of decipher what's going on downrange. Exactly. Yeah, it really yeah. it really makes a difference. Yeah, uh, and uh, as far as powder, target, target. Wow, that's a that's a classic combination right there, a dasher with Vargit and a 105 burger hybrid. Wow. That's <laughs> what I started with when I started this game and and uh, been using it. I've actually used DTAX for a while. Um and they were working real good, but then I they some things changed there. I uh I started using the hybrids again. The hybrids, man, lot to lot, box to box, they just don't vary very much. It's you can always count on them. So and that's one thing in this game. You have to have something that's consistent, you know. So, those, man, those 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 one or fives are incredible. I mean, yeah. hard hard. That's a hard bullet to beat. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You mentioned earlier uh, that you have a device that kind of gives you is it like some type of countdown timer to let you know how much time you have left in the stage? What what device are you using for that? You no, know, it's I think it's Scientific is the brand. It's like thirty bucks on Amazon, but it, it gives you um, you can set it for how much time you want. So I can set it for four minutes for the Hunter series, or you know two minutes for this, or ninety seconds, and it will give you a verbal. It's a it's a lady's voice that says two minutes remaining, one minute remaining. Then after that, it's fifty seconds, forty, thirty. 20, 10, and then it gives you a nine, eight, seven, all the way down to one. So, man, I highly recommend that for anybody who doesn't run a timer. I know that, uh, that Francis uses Chad's and chat. I, I haven't seen that timer yet. Um, I don't know if it's verbal or not, but, uh, knowing without having to look exactly how much time you have, you know, when you sit down on your last day, your last, your last, uh, position and you have, two shots left and you're thinking, man, do I have to rush these? Do I not? And that thing says 10 seconds and you're like, oh, I got lots of time. Don't hurry, make good shots. It it gives you a lot of peace of mind. And I have a buddy, uh, Jason Alvarez just started using that uh, a few months ago and he was always rushing the last shots. And man, he's done so much better on those last shots now that he's been running that timer. So I highly recommend people to use some kind of timer like that. But I uh, I put some Velcro on the back of that and put it on the back of my, uh, I use your, um, your data card holder. And I put the super Velcro on the back of that. And I put the timer on the back of that. So I can't see it. It's facing the other way. It's facing away from me on the back of that data card holder but I just push the button and it talks to me. I don't need to see it. So how do you, how do you start it at the beginning of the stage? There's a button, there's six buttons on it. And it's just the one on the bottom left corner when it's facing away from me. I just, uh, you know, you, you, you set it to how much time you want it to start at and just push the button and it starts going. If you, uh, if you, I have, you know, I haven't seen that before. Uh, and I, I really like that concept. I mean, I'm one, I've been using a timer, I've used uh, Chad's timer, uh, his little countdown timer. I've used the sport count, the count up and the countdown timer. Um, and, you know, and they're, but I, yeah, I'm, 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 you know, I'm a, I typically in a period skill stage, I'm like, I'm trying to finish it like 80 seconds. I'm just, go, I just want to clean it every time I shoot it, you know? So I'm using up all the, all the, all the stage time and, and I'm just about every stage I'm shooting at. Like, I don't want to get through it in a hurry. I want to take as much time as I can. So I'm really always paying attention to that time. Um, but I do like the verbal that's, that's, uh, and it's, and it's loud enough for you can hear it. I mean, you can hear it through your, your protection and 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's plenty loud. And like I said, is Chad's is Chad's verbal or is it just uh, visual? Uh, it is not. Uh, it'll it'll start beeping when it gets down to the time you set it. So like if you want, let's just say you got a 90 second stage. If you like one thing I did, I would set it for uh, for like five seconds or 10 seconds short of the end of the part time. So I'd shut it for like a minute and 20 seconds. And uh, and so I would like I knew when that got off, I had 10 seconds left. And, and you can it's also it's visual. It's an LED. So you can see it as well. Um, but that is really just giving you beeps. It's not really giving you a like the, spoken word. Kind of, like the, kind of like the sport count. So, and I use sport count for years and, uh, that's really good. The only thing is you got to look at it, you know, yeah. uh, it takes a second to look at it, but you still have to think about looking at it. Um, this one, you don't have to look at it. It just tells you. If you, if you can send me a link, uh, to that, I will put that into the, uh, into the description section of this uh, and this winter circle. So people who are listening to this thing can find it and purchase it off of Amazon or whatever source that, that you bought it. But absolutely, uh, I'll do it. It's, like I say, it's on Amazon. It's like 30 bucks and, and, uh, it's awesome. But yeah, you go to all these ROs that have never seen it before and they're like, that is cool. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't believe I hadn't heard of that thing yet, man. Wow. Yeah, it saves you some points for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Well, good deal. Well, Rusty, I'll tell you what, buddy, that was uh, that was some great information. Uh, and it was great talking to you about the match. And uh, especially, you know, that that uh, that practice session that you described as far as, you know, recording your impacts on target and calling it out, I think, is something that uh, is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful, uh, you know, practice session to try if you have the ability to do it, because I like that just. You know that look. That's the that's the intent of, of this winter circle is to get that information out. And so, you know, you you recognize you had an issue. You've always been a top level shooter, right? But you recognize there's been a weakness in your game, and you kind of came up with a method of being able to practice and identify and help kind of fix that. And you did it. And then what happens is you go out and you win a match. I mean, like how awesome is that? Yeah, I uh, I was listening to Francis and Chad on their on their podcast, and at one point in time they said they saw like ninety to ninety five percent of their hits on target i'm like holy cow i see a i'm i don't see about 90 to 95 <laughs> on target. i need to fix this and so anyway well, it, uh, it seems to work well good job well thank you for spending some uh some time with us uh tonight rusty and again congratulations on your victory this past weekend and and i'm, I'm sure we'll have you on again here very soon and um and for all you uh, listeners and watchers, thank you for being a part of the Winter Circle podcast tonight. This is episode 18, is that right? Uh, episode 19 of the season one of the 2023 PRS season. Rusty, thank you, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me on, Phil. I appreciate it. All right. You good have- night. All right.